then we will go to our first bootstrap example. So I will review how to get a bound on, on the coupling, on a cubic coupling. And then I will talk about uh, how we can use this S matrix bootstrap to constrain the space of O and theories. And I will explain what this object we call monolith is. And finally, if I have enough time, I will talk about to derive these bounds, namely the primal and dual approach and their advantages. Okay, so I know there is a uh, half an hour of uh, questions later, but please interrupt me if you have questions. All right, so what is the S matrix bootstrap? The general idea of this program to find a non-perturbative S matrix by imposing some consistency conditions arising from general physical principles. So there are two key points here. One is this term non-perturbative. So as you know very well for weakly interacting theories, um, we know very well how to describe them. We can use perturbation theory. So if we have some Lagrangian and we want to compute some observable like a cross-section, we can uh, derive Feynman rules, do perturbation theory, and everything works very well. However, um, for strongly coupled theories, this is not the case. We have uh, less tools at our disposal. They are much harder to handle. So this matrix bootstrap program is really a non-perturbative approach which allows us to say things about um, general QFTs, so be weakly interacting or strongly interactive. So what I said here is that, okay, this doesn't work very well. For weakly coupled theories, we have perturbation theory, whereas for strongly coupled ones that are harder to handle. And the second key point is this second part. So this is really the bootstrap philosophy that um, was already introduced yesterday in the Gong show. So instead of trying to compute some by making approximation, one can extract information about it simply by imposing some consistency conditions. So uh, for a little bit of history, so this Butra philosophy is not new at all. It actually has its roots in the S-Matrix program of the 1960s. So there, people were trying to describe the strong nuclear force. And they made amazing progress in understanding properties about non-perturbative as matrices. Uh, however, this program was largely abandoned after the rise of QCD and basically forgotten. Um, but this this bootstrap philosophy kept going on, and in the 70s and 80s, for instance, it was applied to conformal field theories with great success in two-dimensional ones. And this success is basically mainly because people were able to find exact solutions to these consistency equations. So um, they understood many things about two-dimensional CFTs. And I should also mention that this bootstrap philosophy can also be applied to interval theories. So I will talk more about these interval theories um, later in the talk. But these are special type of theories where uh, you have infinite conserved charges, so there are more things you can impose, and there you can also bootstrap S matrices and find exact solutions. 
However, for more general theories, or even for higher dimensional conformal field theories, finding these exact solutions is quite hard. So this test matrix program and also the conformal bootstrap program fell dormant for a while until um, I think it's 2008. There was a revival of the conformal bootstrap by a group of mostly Italian uh, gentlemen. So, Ratazzi, Rikov, Tony and Vicky. And the key idea they put forward here is instead of trying to find some exact solution to these consistency equations, one can derive bounds and in this way rule out candidate solutions. So really excluding space uh, theory, uh, regions in the space of theories. So this idea is really powerful. There has been amazing progress here, so just to give the perhaps more famous, most famous example, you can use this type of exclusion principle to actually get the determine the critical exponents of the 3D easing model. So as of now, this bootstrap is the best way to derive these critical exponents. So this is just to say it's really a powerful idea. And um, so later, regarding this S matrix program, uh, in 2016, there was also a revival for this S matrix bootstrap. And, um, okay, I should write the authors. Is Miguel Paulo, João Penedones, John Toledo, Volt Van Ries, and Pedro Vieira. So these authors were very much inspired by this revival of the conformal bootstrap. So again, uh, the idea is to derive bounds and in this way constrain the space of QFTs. So the bounds will be in certain parameters of the theory. It'll be clear when we go to the examples. Con constrain space of QFTs. Okay, so this is a bit of history. Uh, I've been talking about these general principles, consistency conditions. Let's see what they actually are for the S matrix. Unless there are questions. Okay, so let's see what these general principles are for the S matrix. So the first one is unitarity. So we know the S matrix should satisfy this equation. And this is simply telling us that we are in some quantum theory where this S matrix relates in to out states. It's a unitary operator. And in other words, probabilities are sum up to one. So we know the probability of certain scattering process to occur is given by some S matrix element. And this condition tells us that all possible scatterings would sum up to one. The next one is crossing. So crossing tells us that we can relate different scattering processes by send switching in and out particles. So for instance, if we have some two to two scattering of particles one and two going to three and four, this process should be related to the one where we start with particles one and three, okay, maybe with some conjugate, and they go to two and four. So this is crossing symmetry. And finally, perhaps the least intuitive one, but very important, 
we have analyticity. So basically, the, the physical scattering amplitudes that one would write in terms of the center of mass energy, the scattering angle, are actually analytic functions of complex variables. And these uh, physical amplitudes would be boundary values of these analytic functions. So the question about analyticity is understanding what are the possible singularities in the complex plane where the variables are some kinematic invariant, invariants, singularities. And the idea is that these singularities are determined by on shell processes. So one could actually spend hours talking about uh, what people did in the 60s to derive analyticity domains, starting from which axioms. But I really want to be very practical, so just to show you how these key concepts um, translate in a specific examples, so that hopefully the next time you open a, an S-Matrix Bootstrap paper, you, you will know what's going on. So I know this is very general for now, but we will be very concrete. Yeah? Possible problems. Uh, for regarding? instance, um, things like massless particles and things like that. Should we already think that maybe this is more for like massive or? Um... So here I will focus on massive quantum mm -hmm. field theories, where these things are more under control. Mm -hmm. But there, there's also work for massless theories, and I think uh, including. Uh, so for instance, another thing that. So I guess there are two things that I could be worried about. One is massless particles, just because this matrix, I guess, is a bit trickier. And the other is things that actually have some invariance, or they're like gauge bosons, and they, you really would need to fix the gauge before scattering things Yeah, like so that. that's more, more complicated. We mm -hmm. will do the most basic mm -hmm. <laughs> massive scalar. Okay. Um, can I also ask one question? Yeah. I mean, you said that, that uh, this analyticity, all, all possible singularities should be determined by on cell processes. But uh, as we know, there are these anomalous thresholds, so not always is possible yeah. to do that. So, so what would you do about it? I mean, uh, in these on shell processes, I'm including those. So in the end, you can. This would arise from some of the Landau diagrams mm -hmm. where you put particles and shell in the middle. Um, Okay, I will make a comment about this yeah, yeah. when I talk about it. But yeah, this includes Landau singularities. More questions about this general introduction? All right. <laughs> so now we will pass to the second part of the talk and talk about uh, two-dimensional amplitudes. So as you, uh, as you know, uh, saying general things about non-perturbative matrices is very hard in general. So we will focus on a simple scenario. We work in two space-time dimensions, and we look at 2 to 2 scattering of particles with the same mass m scalars. And OK, we have some momenta p1 to p4. So now we want to know how these general principles apply for this 2 to 2 scattering. So the first thing to note is that by Lorentz invariance, we expect this as matrix element to be a function of the Mandelstam variables s, t, and u. So s is p1 plus p2 squared. t is p1 minus p4. 
and u is p1 minus p3 squared. They satisfy this condition, s plus t plus u equals 4m squared. So we actually have just two independent variables. However, as you can check in two dimensions for this 2 to 2 scattering, if you solve for energy momentum conservation, you will see that the only way to solve this energy momentum conservation is to have either P1 equal to P3 and P2 to P4, or the other way around. So this is for 2 to 2 scattering in two dimensions. So this says that basically we can set u to be zero. So we have only one independent variable, which is s. So this s will be the 2 to 2 s matrix element. I will say s matrix, but uh, from now on, we'll just talk about this 2 to 2 scattering. OK, so that's already a lot of uh, simplifications. We have one function of one complex variable. Now, um, unitarity here tells us that the absolute value of this function is bounded above by one. So to be super clear how this inequality arises from this equality of the S matrix, what should be equal to one is two to two plus two to everything else. So you're just sandwiching this equation here by some two states, yes? So but this equation that you wrote, uh, I would naively only impose it for physical scattering, Yes, right? sorry, I, I forgot to say. So this is not for all S, mm -hmm. but for physical values of the center of mass energy, which, are, which is S bigger than 4M squared. Yes, so this is about this general principle of analyticity. You are right that if you compute some cross-section, you only care about real variables, real or mass energy in this um, range. However, the power of this S-matrix program is really um, think about these functions as boundary values of some complex function in the complex plane. So yeah, that's uh, a key point. More questions? All right, so that's unitarity. And then we have crossing symmetry. So basically this relates the S and, and T variables. So, well, <coughs> the, the function at S and T. Uh, you can see it in some pictorial way by switching the arrow of time. So here we are writing S of S, which uh, makes sense when time is flowing in this direction. We have some center of mass energy, P1 plus P2 squared. But we could also look at this process in this way. So now we would have P1 minus P4. And crossing then tells us that S of S is the same as S of T, which is 4M squared minus S. So for this function for complex S, we have this condition of unitarity for physical values, and in general, they should, uh, it should satisfy this crossing condition. All right, so now for the analyticity. <clears throat> so as I said, we want to understand how these functions look in the complex Mandelstam S plane. So what type of singularities can we have? First, we can have, well, we have a 
branch cut starting at 4m squared. This is a two particle threshold when we can start having processes of this type with two intermediate particles. Then uh, with this crossing condition, we know there should also be a cut starting at zero. So for the crossed um, diagram here. And then we also have higher particle thresholds. So we could start some, uh, we could start here at um, nine m squared or 16 m squared by having more intermediate particles here. So that also gives us branch cuts, uh, similarly for the crossed one. But then, um, what about other particles in the theory? If we have some more stable particles in the theory, they would appear as poles. So for instance, some bounce. Can you see the red, or should I use? Can you see? A little bit. White, white OK. <coughs> So a pole for some bound state, that is some process like this, where MB is the mass of the state in the middle. And again, with crossing, we have another pole at 4M squared minus MB squared. And for any bound state or stable particle you have in the theory, you would also add more poles. So here I will come back to, to the comment on anomalous thresholds, which you can ignore if this is already too much for you. So to say this is all the analytic uh, properties you have, I'm assuming that M is the lightest particle in the theory. Otherwise, you have these anomalous thresholds. So as I said, this would arise from some Landau diagrams, which, for instance, you have this triangle diagram that you need to work out if the mass in the middle here is less than the external one. But I will just think that this is the lightest particle, <coughs> so this is really all we can have. Can I also ask another question? So you interpret all of these branch cuts as some perturbative uh, diagrams. How do you know that there is no other non-perturbative singularity? Very naively. Um, let me think, choose what to say. So, I mean, you're right, you can see this from some perturbative Feynman diagram, but you ex expect this just, say, from, from the unitarity equation. So there you put some intermediate states in between. It's a physical, um, physical values of the energy. You know there's in some discontinuity, imaginary part, the optical theorem. So you know that you should have a branch cut there, yes. non perturbatively um, To say this is really all you have in general, <laughs> it's not completely proven. So what people did, but I'm not a super expert on it yet, is, uh, for instance, you can start from correlation functions and Whitman axioms, do some analytic extension, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and derive some analytic domains. So, of course, people were worried about the real world, so yeah. four-dimensional <laughs> theories. But so in two dimension also, there is no, if, so maybe in two dimension is easier to get some non-perturbative state, but also in that case, it's yeah, not completely I think clear. As far as I know, there's no complete derivation of it, but uh, it is also expected, say, from causality conditions by looking at plane waves and doing this, that there shouldn't be singularities in the upper half plane, for instance. Yeah, yeah. So th there are many pieces and considerations that tell you, okay, this really makes sense, but you can take it as an axiom as well. Yeah, 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 thank you. There was some other question, maybe. because I, I was lost, uh, the meaning of the values of S greater than 4M squared and less than zero? I mean, what is the physics there? Yeah, so 
great question because I forgot to say something. Um, yeah, as we know, unitarity would be evaluated for physical values. So these physical values are really, okay, this is useless. Here, um, right above this right hand cut. So when you do an experiment and compute something, this is really where you would evaluate this function. And then um, I was saying you also have this cut starting at zero from crossing symmetry. Yeah, so the, the thing is that these values here would be related to the cross channel. So if you are computing the, so not uh, one, two going to three, four, but one, four going to two, three, the physical values would be here. Uh, Uh, why do we have the cuts? Yes. Ah, okay. So you can see it. So I have the set yeah. uh, Yes. But then beyond that? Yeah, so if you think about this diagram, you can start having this diagram at this value four m squared, but then you can have any energy in between. So this is why you have some continuum after that um, where you still have the singularity for this diagram. So if you just compute, say, this bubble diagram in phi to the four theory, you see there is a square root starting at four m squared. Maybe if I can make another comment, I don't know if that helps, but so if you think of doing the optical theorem, mm -hmm. that tells you that that amplitude that you are computing there should have some imaginary part. Right? Yeah, so. And because you have an imaginary part, essentially, using the unitarity condition, you also see that there, there must be a cut, essentially. In order to satisfy that condition, it must be that, more or less, when you complex conjugate, you change the sign. That means that there must be a cut. To see that it's a square root cut is a bit more complicated, I guess, but that's. Yeah. Yeah, so for everyone, uh, as I was saying before, but perhaps wasn't very clear, it also comes just from unitarity and the optical theorem. So you input some complete bases inside here. You start with the two particle states, which can have any er energy starting from 4m squared. And this will give you some imaginary part that you relate to this discontinuity across the, the cut. And th 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 I had just a small comment because actually in two dimension there is a bit more of a zoology of singularities that you can have. Like you can have things like higher poles, for instance. I mean, not all the poles are simple bound state poles. There is a whole zoology of things that you can have in principle. Yeah. So and the, it gets a, a bit messy. There are this Coleman tune stuff. Yeah, for instance, stuff like that. It's, so uh, these are part of these anomalous thresholds. Uh, yeah, this is still perturbative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they have an inter perturbative interpretation. Yeah, yeah. So all these Landau diagrams in two dimensions will give rise to some poles. This is a simple pole, but as Alessandro is saying, um, we can have double poles as well, for instance, for these diagrams here. And we do have exact S matrices with, with these double poles. Okay. I'm going very slow, but it's fine. Um, no, let's go here. So now that we understood this 2 to 2 scattering, let's see how can, can we just do some bootstrap problem. Um, no, sorry, before that, I will introduce the dispersion relation. Uh, 
okay. I will need this. So, the dispersion relation is a simple way to write an ansatz for this as matrix that already has these analytic properties and crossing uh, built in. So, the idea is to start with some uh, contour here, write uh, Cauchy's theorem. Uh, I like colors. <laughs> okay. No, but then the green is worse, purple. Purple is the same. <laughs> okay. So we start with some counter, and then since we know all these analytic properties, we just blow it up, pick up the singularities, we go across the cuts. So this is the idea for the dispersion relation. So I will just write it down. We are writing this function s of s as some Cauchy integral around this contour I put there. And if I just blow up this contour, I will get some contribution from the arches at infinity. Then I will pick up these bound state poles. So let me say again that this is just for uh, pedagogical purposes, but you can have as many bound states as you want or as few of them. And then you have these discontinuities across the cuts. So this is the residue of the ball, and this is how you define the non-perturbative coupling. So we can borrow what we know about perturbation theory and Feynman diagrams. So this will be some cubic coupling between our particles M and MB. And this is how you define the non-perturbative coupling. Okay, so we have the discontinuity across the cut, and here we're just doubling up. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, yes, precisely. Okay. So this is the dispersion relation. <coughs> and now let's go to the bootstrap problem. So the, the recipe, if you want, for solving some bootstrap problem is the following. First, we will choose some spectrum. So we cannot just bootstrap everything at the same time. We're thinking about a particular spectrum, which will tell you what the analytic properties are for this S-matrix element. So we have our particle with mass M, which we're scattering. We could have many bound states, etc. cetera. Um, then we make an answer. For S of S, which uh, using this dispersion relation, you can trivialize crossing and the analyticity properties here. So the only thing that's left to impose is unitarity. So now the, the problem itself would be to maximize some functional. of this uh, S-matrix element. Uh, most of the time, we will need to do this numerically. So we will use this uh, S-infinity, G, and rho as parameters in our ansatz. And OK, we would need to discretize, for instance, this density rho. And as I said, we need to impose unitarity 
for physical values of s. So we would impose this condition in some grid of physical values of s, sj. OK, so this is the, the recipe. Basically, by, by choosing what to maximize, you are choosing the problem you want to solve. So let's go into the first oops, problem. Yeah, so this is an example where we have just one one bound state, but you can have uh, a sum, zero. Right, so this row is really the discontinuity across a cut. Yes, so this is why you have this. I, yeah, simplified some things, so you would write for some interval from zero to minus infinity, but, um, I'm using the fact that t is 4m squared minus s. Um, why? Because we want to derive some bounds to be able to explore the space of quantum field theories in some way. And what depends on you. So I will show two specific examples of what kind of things you can optimize. Yeah, so usually it will be some linear uh, functional on S. But I, I will show examples. So this first example is perhaps the simplest non-trivial one. Maybe and if we can ask a very general question. Yeah. So in two dimensions there is also another variable that you could have used, which is this rapidity variable. The what, sorry? This rapidity variable. Uh, I okay, maybe you, you'll get there. Yes. So, okay, no worries. Soon enough. <laughs> okay, <coughs> so this first example was uh, done in this revival of uh, the asymmetric bootstrap problem by the author, authors I cited earlier. So the problem here is to start with this spectrum. So just the particles were scattering a sing and a single bound state. And this will describe, uh, well, we could have some possible cubic coupling, as I was uh, discussing here. And the, the functional we want to maximize will be this cubic coupling. So G, which is the residue, well, G squared, at the bound state pole for this S matrix. And now, uh, to give some physical intuition for why this type of uh, you can think of the following. So, by increasing this uh, coupling, you're basically increasing the binding energy between these particles. So you would expect to have a bound state with a lower mass, since you're increasing the binding energy, or to create more bound states. But uh, that would be changing the assumption of the spectrum you're making. So for a fixed spectrum, really some number to m and mb, this is why you would expect to have a, a bound on g. And okay, it should be positive by unitarity, so you really care about the upper bound. All right, so that's the physical intuition. And now let's see what you get. So if you repeat this uh, um, maximization really by just doing find max in Mathematica for different bound state masses, you will find a curve like this. Okay, it's supposed to be symmetric. This is square root of two, this is zero, this is two. So what this plot means is that 
the theory is compatible with this spectrum and these three conditions of crossing unitarity and analyticity would be would live if you want below this bound so if someone tells you oh i have a theory with a this spectrum and a cubic coupling here, you know it's not compatible with these principles. Okay, so when you do this maximization, you not only get G, but the fullest matrix, since you have an ansatz for it and you're, you're solving the full optimization problem. So you can check what S matrices saturate this bound. And what you find is that the S matrix saturating this bound is the sign Gordon <coughs> S matrix for the breathers. So let's take an advantage that we are in two dimensions and we can write exact S matrices. So for some of you, this is very well known. It's a CDD factor um, where this theta is the rapidity variable Alessandro wanted to see related to Mandelstam S in this way. So, uh, okay, this is the same but with a minus sign and lambda would be related to the bound state mass. Yes, may I ask? So in yep. your boot principle, you make an ansatz for S of Z. So is this ansatz unique by choosing different, that, that, that solve uh, these constraints? So can you have like two S of Z that solve the constraint and then when you do the bootstrap, you get different bounds? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. So the ANSET has some free parameters, uh, for instance, this constant, this coupling we want to maximize, and this density. And the optimization uh, procedure finds these parameters, the optimal parameters, such that the objective, which in this case is this, is maximized. So it gives all the parameters, and therefore you have the, the S matrix um, that optimizes that, okay. that problem. Okay. Does that answer? Yes, yeah, I think so. Okay. Sorry, maybe a related question is what, what ansatz do you make for rho of x? Sorry, what? What ansatz do you make for rho of x? I mean, it seems it's not just one parameter, right? Uh, so this function would be some, well, some continuous function in X. So what you do is to discretize it. So basically you find some, you put some finite number of parameters, which would be rho evaluated at a point here along this curve. But I'm not saying, I'm not fixing it to be something. This really parameters. Finite, a finite number of this n, or? Yeah, so yeah. if you do numerics, you have to do finite. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the question was maybe the following. Uh, when you write the dispersion relation, uh, is this the only way to make an ansatz uh, that satisfies uh, you? Yeah, and or one can come up. So um, well, this ansatz has crossing and analyticity, which is uh, yes. really the hard one to, to input. And then unitarity is an extra constraint in the problem. Mm -hmm. um, so the I wouldn't know how else to write these analytic properties. I mean, of course, you can do some change of variables and write it in term, instead of this uh, X, sorry, S variable in terms of or on the disk or whatever, but since you really want to say, okay, these are the analytic properties, I think you, you need to work with this. What happens if you also use extra ones that I guess you don't, do not use, like the 2 to n? Answers looked at this. Yeah, so... This is basically an open problem in, in the community uh, because we know pretty well what the answer should be for 2 to 2 scattering, but for multiparticle amplitudes, these Landau singularities and all that are really complicated. So 
yeah, it's uh, something, one of the open problems of how to include this multiparticle. Chris, the choose more points and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I wanted to discuss this in the last part. Um, let me go back to that in, in later. No, I just wanted to say that the ansatz would be always the same. It's the unitary condition that changes if you add multi-particles, just that. No, the ans I mean, you don't know what are all the analytic properties for oh, higher point the amplitudes. Ansatz for the two to four. No, but the ansatz for the 2 to 2 is the same. I mean, that's the ah, special right. relation. No, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the question was specifically the 2 to 4. 2 yeah. to 3, 2 to 8. Oh, whatever, right? Whatever you want. Then you would have different discontinuities. Now it would be more complicated. No, you will have different functions. Different functions that contribute to different discontinuities. I mean, yeah. the, the row there can have like yeah. it's a distribution, so it can have like additional. Uh, but then the idea is always I have bound state, and then the I have more bound state, and I have more discontinuities, but the structure is the same. I cannot have like multiple things that are more complicated objects. Like you will always be the same. Like the structure is the same. Yeah, there will be for a the path, two to two. Yeah, yeah. And Andres, right? Uh, this I is for the two to n. There are some answers, but the so the uh, yeah. Yeah, you have more functions, but also what what a specifically what a specific singularities you have are much more complicated, and I wouldn't say it's a solved issue. Can, can I ask a naive question about this row? I mean, it seems you assume it's some continuous function, mm -hmm. but uh, so could it be something more complicated than that? I mean, you have I mean, this could, bound with unitarity, so you cannot have some pole or something like this. No, but uh, I mean, uh, what I'm saying is that the approximation procedure that you are, are using assumes that rho, the, rho, rho of x is kind of, con cannot have uh, singularities or... Uh, I, I mean, mean cannot be, like, uh, there cannot be distributions, contributions, for instance. Or could it be? No, I, I think this is, uh, it should be a function. I'm not saying where it should be, but I'm saying, okay, I'm discretizing it and then integrating uh, this kernel with some linear, with something like this. Um, but it's really just that some, some function. Okay. I guess that the, the assumption that this thing is multi sort of justified by the fact that it's really defined not on the real line, but above, above the cut, so it's sort of fine. Yeah, it's this i epsilon. A another thing is that uh, couldn't you get rid of that integral on rho by just working on this theta plane to begin with? I mean, the theta plane you resolve that branch cut, right? You still have pause, but your life should be a little bit simpler, I guess, right? Um, but I mean, you still need to have some some function for the the boundary, the function at the boundary where you evaluate unitarity. Otherwise, you cannot say my ansatz is just a pole because you're fixing the S matrix. If you say my ansatz is just a pole, you need so to have some freedom to. Uh, can't you just deform? I guess it depends on how these things fall off at infinity, right? But. Uh, Okay, so in the theta plane, instead of having these cuts, as you know, they open up. But again, you have this contour of integration that you're blowing up, so you still have the integration along these boundaries here, which okay. would map to this discontinuity and to rho. No, because you don't know what's there in the because other sheets. It depends on the problem, uh, but in principle, yes. So you don't know what's below in the second sheet. You can have more cuts and, in general, infinites of them. But you don't know what's there in the other sheet. So you don't want to blow up the contour everywhere. OK, I should really go because I need to show you. I want to at least show you one cool picture. So. Okay, I was here in this maximum coupling example, 
And I said this uh, bound is saturated by this uh, S matrix, which is the S matrix for sine Gordon breath. This is an integrable S matrix. So I know many of you are experts, but just to give a very crude <laughs> definition of integrability, um, these are usually two dimensional theories with an infinite set of conserved charges. So uh, one consequence of this infinite set of conserved charges is that the scattering can be factorized into a sequence of 2 to 2 scattering. So this is the Young-Baxter equation. And um, this St. Gordon theory is an integrable theory that satisfies this. And um, OK, as we will see, these integrable theories arise very naturally in this two-dimensional S-matrix bootstrap. And um, OK, so I just want to show quickly another more complicated example. Um, so if we consider a slightly more complicated scenario where we have um, not just identical particles scattering, but some global symmetry in it, we'll see that although this is a very simple generalization, it gives a very rich structure and teaches us a lot about this uh, space of QFTs. So, I think this was four. I will talk about Owen theories and the monolith. So, very quickly, we're again considering 2 to 2 scattering of particles with the same mass, but now they live in, they transform in the vector representation of Owen. So, they carry some index ijkl, which run from 1 to n. And now our S matrix has these indices as well. But basically, we can write everything in terms of three functions. So here we had just one. Here we will have three. So to take into account these indices, we can write the possible um, tensor structures for ON. So we have some Kronecker deltas. And then three functions, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. Um, as coefficients for these tensor structures. So OK, this is where the indices contract in this way. This would be the identity. And this is the permutation. Um, of course, one can also write this in terms of um, irreducible representations. So with some projector, projectors here. And this index A would be either the singlet, antisymmetric, or symmetric representation. So the difference here is that we have three functions instead of one. But um, for this representation in terms of EREPs, unitarity will be the same. So you have that for each of these three functions, they are bounded by one. Again, for physical values of S. Crossing, it is simple to see in this representation. So see by looking into different directions, sigma one and sigma three should be related. And sigma two is related to itself. So sigma 1 of s is sigma 3 of form squared minus s, and the same with sigma 2. In terms of these representations, is something that mixes the different singlet antisymmetric and symmetric. So there is some crossing matrix that depends on n in some way. 
and S of S, SV of S. And then analyticity would be the same as before for each of these S of A. You can put bound states in different representations, but again, you have the same analytic properties. So let me go to, to this monolith business. Yeah, sorry, it's the global symmetry. Um, yeah, scalar particles that transform in the vector representation of ON. Um, it's really just a simple generalization, or you can think of it as some toy model for pion scattering or something like this. All right, so the other example I want to show here is um, this bootstrap problem. So imagine you don't have any bound states in any of the representations. So there are no poles in these uh, functions S A of S. And the question we asked is, what is the space of ON theories with this uh, condition of no bound states? So this is something we did with Ife, Martin, uh, and Pedro. And to explore this, this space, what we want to maximize are some linear combinations of these S matrices at some point. You can choose it to be anything you want. So this is just some way to explore this space of uh, um, functions S, A of S. And one thing to note is that this space is infinite since you have S is a continuous variable, so it's an infinite space. But the idea we had was to plot different subsections of this space. So what I will show you. is what we found. So this is what we call the monolith. It's a three-dimensional subsection of the infinite space. So what I'm plotting here is in the three axes are, well, I think it's in the sigma representation, but sigma one, two, three at a given point, which I think it's three m squared here. So what this plot means is that inside this region here, theories are compatible with everything we want, and outside they wouldn't be allowed. So you see there are some, some vertices, some edges. So a natural question to ask is, are these vertices something special? Do they correspond to some interesting theory? And the answer is yes. So, okay, each of these points is a, a point you run numerically. So I think for this one, it's 200,000 points or something like this. Okay, so that's the monolith. Now, yeah, I can repeat it. Yeah, so you can think of this as some quartic, effective quartic coupling. So just evaluating this at a specific point inside the, the physical sheet. So some effective quartic coupling and um, yeah, in terms of uh, functions in the complex plane, it makes sense that it's bounded since you know it's bounded at the boundary by unitarity. So in this cut plane, um, you know that at the boundary you have unitarity. On the other side, using these crossing relations, it's also bounded. But it's bounded on the boundary everywhere, and by continuity you say it must bounded. Yes. Time. Yes. Okay. So 
Uh, what should I say? I still have some time. Right? You can, uh, yeah. I think you can go on a little bit since there were questions and then we can smoothly go into a discussion. Yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. So, I will try to... So, this would be what you saw <laughs> earlier. Uh, so it was crucial to have this projector function. So for instance, this very um, obvious vertex, what is it? And it's not something very excited, <laughs> exciting, it's just free theory. So this is where all of these functions are just one. But it's nice to see that it's really something special about this space of theories. Now, uh, there is another vertex here. It's not as apparent as this one, but in this uh, three-dimensional plot, you see really there is some edge ending there. So this one is the nonlinear sigma model. Sorry, I forgot to say this is for n bigger than two. So this is the Owen nonlinear sigma model. It's also an integrable theory, so you know precisely what this S matrix is. It was found by Zamologikov and Zamologikov in the 70s. And roughly, it is something like this. So in terms of this rapidity function, it's just some gamma functions four of them in the numerator and four of them in the denominator, and n enters in this way. So you see it's really something very, very precise, and it precisely matches this point, which is also a vertex. Now, there is another interesting point here, which is not really a vertex. There are some edges that kind of disappear or flatten out as you get there. So this is another integrable theory, which has no known model behind. So it's an integrable matrix. We call periodic Young-Baxter, because it solves Young-Baxter equations and has some periodicity properties. So basically, it's something similar to this, but with an infinite product of them. And there is no known model for it. Actually, it was found also in the 70s, or Taksu. It's hidden in some appendix, just as a solution to the Jan Baxter equations. And Okay, finally, there is some other simple point here. It is not a vertex or almost a vertex, but it's something very simple. It's just a constant solution, so it doesn't depend on theta or s. And in the different representations, you have something like free theory and then something that depends on n, which is less than one, of course. So this is a, a constant solution. But in, in general, we know how these functions look in the boundary of this space. You can just plot them. And remember, we don't have bound states, so in the physical sheet, they cannot have poles. So what we see is just a bunch of zeros corresponding to resonance, resonance states since these zeros would imply some poles in, in other sheets. So all the theories here at the boundary, in general, they have infinite resonances. And, um, okay, I'll go on and you tell me when to shut up. Something very interesting and puzzling we found is that these optimal S matrices have some periodicity um, in this 
theta rapidity. So if you want, it is something like in the log of S or log of the energy. And this is quite puzzling. So if you go along some, some curve here that passes through all these points, and you plot the, the periodicity, the period of, of these functions, you will see that it diverges at free theory. It has some local minima at the periodic Jan Baxter point. It diverges again at the nonlinear sigma model. So this is a period. And this in in this plane it would be something like sigma two evaluated at some some point. Um, then it goes to zero in this constant solution and diverges again. Ah, I forgot to say um, this monolith is actually symmetric. So basically, if you just flip the signs of all these matrices, you find another solution to this optimization problem. So you have two copies of this. You have free and minus free, nonlinear sigma model, minus, etc. So this would be minus free theory, if you want. So there is this periodicity in theta. And this period changes as you move along the boundary. And again, we find this by looking at the S matrix and how these zeros move. Sorry, I'm a bit confused. So why is the periodicity of the free theory infinite and the one of the constant theory is zero? I mean, isn't it the same thing? Formally, they're just constants, right? If it's a constant, I mean, it doesn't have any period or it has the any okay, period Okay, so it's just not defined. It's the limit how you approach it that looks like that, right? Yeah, so it's just looking at the at these zeros and how they move, that you mm -hmm. see that you start here with some finite period, and as you go to free theory, these zeros just uh, and, and move and away. So this is why I say. This limit does not depend on how you approach it. I mean, this is a surface, so I guess you have several ways of getting to this. No. Uh, OK. Very naive question. Is there any meaning between, because you draw some continuous line, I know it's numerical plots and blah, blah, but is there any physical meaning from the various trajectories that you have from one point to another one, or is, or is it just connecting different points? Physical meaning. So like some flow or some parameter space or something? Um, no, I mean, since we know, we only know specific points on it, right. and the rest of it is new. We don't know what they are. Okay. I, I, yeah. Okay. Maybe it would be very nice to find some, yeah, some physical flow from one right. to the other. Okay, thank you. I mean, very <laughs> mathematically, you can write all of these as matrices as infinite products of gamma functions with some parameters. And as you move these parameters, you change where these zeros are and you, you are um, going to these points for different uh, parameters. So. This is mathematically what it is. Physically, yeah, it's a good question. So this periodicity, although somehow in the maximization procedure it makes sense, you it kind of makes sense. You want to have some phases at the boundary for unitarity, so we cannot uh, prove it. Like you really need to have some periodic function to to have these uh, optimal S matrices. But physically, it's very strange because it would say the S matrix is periodic in some uh, parametrization of the energy. So it's very mysterious. We, we don't have uh, the answer, but if we have some thoughts, you can ask me about it in, in the session. And the last thing I'm going to say is that all these S matrices actually saturate unitarity for the values that you have here. And this is something that you expect for the interval theories. Why? Because you know that there everything is explained in terms of 
two to two scattering, you don't have particle production, so all these two to n s matrices are zero. This is a way to be for interval ones, but we see it everywhere. Also, yeah, in the full surface where the s matrices do not satisfy Jan Baxter and you don't have interability. So this is again something natural from the optimization point of view, but basically uh, it is saying that this is not really the optimal thing we can do, and we would need to input somehow particle production to get something physical. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Real in theta. Right. So the, in this theta plane, you have the physical strip, and um, there is some general periodicity or almost periodicity for crossing. So these gamma functions, they have, uh, if you have some zero here, then you have some pole here, zero pole, zero pole. Uh, uh, there's probably some I, but I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there is some I. So crossing gives you some type of periodicity here, but what we are finding is really here. All right, so the very last thing I'm gonna tell you about, because Sandra will kill me if I don't, is about these two different approaches to get the bounds. So, Basically, I told you about this recipe for the bootstrap problem, which we call the prime approach. So as, oh, okay. as it was already asked, we have some ansatz for our S matrix. Uh, we have some finite number of numbers. So how do these bounds change as we include more parameters? So the idea is that by this primal approach, ah, no, okay, something like this. With this primal approach, we're really exploring this allowed space from the inside. So as we increase the number of parameters in our, in our ansatz, we would get better and better bounds that allow a greater region. So what you do in this primal approach is to change the number of parameters you have until they converge to something. And then you say, ah, okay, I, I have reached some optimal bound. But you cannot really exclude what is outside since you are exploring from the inside. So something we, we figured out is that you can also do a, a dual, let me use red, please, a dual <laughs> approach, which basically explores the space from the outside and it excludes the outside of this region. So, this is uh, conceptually very important because, because it allows you to put rigorous bounds on whatever you're finding. And it's more on the spirit of the conformal bootstrap where you're really excluding theories. So just to give you a flavor of how this dual problem would be, for this specific uh, monolith, we had this functional we were maximizing some linear combination at a point. And you can play with some contour integrations to write this as some contour integral with some function k of s, um, s a of s, where this function has a pole 
precisely at the point where we are maximizing. So this is again just this theorem. Now, um, you can rewrite this as some integral over the cut, again by blowing up this closed contour. So it will be proportional to the density across the cut. And to write it in terms of just one uh, integral, I am imposing some crossing condition on, on these functions k, which so far are just general functions with this um, pole structure that decay fast enough at infinity. So this should be related to KB of S through this crossing symmetric matrix that I, I wrote there. And finally, you know that this should be less or equal to the absolute value of this function here. Where I have used uh, unitarity of S since I'm evaluating at the at the physical values of S. So you see, we started for something from something that depended only on S and ended up with something that depends only on this dual function K, which has these these properties. So this is what I would call a dual functional. And the key point here is that it gives an upper bound on this objective we, we want to maximize. So the maximum of this functional would be bounded by above by the minimum of this dual function which doesn't depend on, on S, only on these functions K. Okay, I'm, I'm being schematic because of the time. So by playing with this minimization problem of some generic analytic functions, except for these poles here, you derive these exclusion plots. And again, as you consider more and more general ansatz for them, you um, converge to the optimal bound here in white. So for this particular problem, this duality gap is actually zero. They just coincide. And um, OK, so the main point of this is that it allows us to put rigorous bounds. I could say more, but there's no time. So let me just summarize. I introduced this S matrix bootstrap program, showed you how we can use it to, to explore the space of allowed QFTs. I gave you some specific examples. We saw in two dimensions there is connection to, to integrable theories. And then I also introduced this dual problem, which allows us to put rigorous bound and basically bracket the optimal bound and it's a complementary approach to, to this primal problem. Thank you. Very good, let's start the discussion. So I saw one question here. So let me first say that I was really talk and I really enjoyed the pace and all the discussion, so thank you. Uh, I have one question since roughly one hour and I think it's where the complication can lie. It's a more overview and really general question is I understand all the procedure but then I stop at the choice of functional and have questions on this like, is there, I mean, any kind of function can be good or what are the properties of this functional or what kind of maximization 
people in general do? So always the coupling constant or something else? How does it work in general? So yeah. Just an overview question. So, really. I mean, Andrea will talk about other examples, okay. but um, let's say the most natural ones or the most used ones are really some physical coupling, like this cubic coupling in any generalization you want. Or uh, for theories without bound states, um, some effective quartic couplings, which you would get by simply evaluating it by at some point. So, yeah, I think these are two, the two main examples. But as I said, you really want you can maximize whatever you want depending on the the theory you're you're looking at, and there are also some computational. Um, um, considerations you can have, like it's better to have some linear functional, you can use certain numerical tools in that case, but yeah, you can really do whatever you want. Other question? Uh, thank you, this was very nice. Yeah, so this is really about these infinite conserved groups, conserved charges, and the fact that you have this young baxter equation that tells you that any scattering, any end-to-end -end scattering, you can write it as a sequence of two to two scattering. So um, you can think also of it as these interval charges basically just move your wave packets, so you can always move them in such a way that they intersect just in two by two. Um, so yeah, it's about this concert charge. So then you said that there are some points in the boundary that are not corresponding to integral In this case, for n bigger than two, it's actually most of it, except for some singular points. No interval theory, but um, no, there can be theories. Yes. Because you said that in that case, you have, I mean, it does affect that the absence of a particle production. Right. So. Uh, I'm not imposing. Uh, that there is no particle production. It's just a result of this optimization since I'm not looking into other higher point functions. So the idea is that once you include everything, I mean, we're talking about S matrix bootstrap, but we're really just looking into two to two scattering, which is not enough to describe most theories. So the idea is that once you uh, have more input into the problem, then whenever it is not interval, this optimal bound would go down and you would have some other, yeah, some other. The, the point that you found is because you have uh, put too much simplification increase, so the actual theory would be a little bit lower than that. Again, I'm not inputting this simplification, it's just uh, I'm not giving all the possible constraints I could. I um, I actually have two questions. One is related to what he was asking. So, uh, what you find with this, um, so looking at the two to two scattering, is that essentially on the boundary you have no particle production, but still you don't have integrability. And so your expectation is that if you were to include higher correction, you would not find these theories on the boundary? Right. Or? You These bounds would go down. The mm. S matrix would change. So you will only have uh, points where you have integrability, which saturate the bounds, and then and all then the other will be inside. And then something below it. Yes. Okay. However, I, I should mention that, um, so as I said, we don't have a systematic way of inputting particle production, mm -hmm. but you can play around and just impose some ad hoc <laughs> particle production and see what happens. So we played this game and we saw that the S matrices change, the boundary changes, so it goes down as it should. Mm -hmm. However, the analytic structure of this S matrix is basically the same. 
the zeros might move a little bit, mm -hmm. but let's say that what you find here might be a good approximation to the yeah, true one. To the true one. Yeah, so, and the other question instead was when you were talking about the periodicity, you were talking about periodicity on the on, for theories on the boundary, right? Yes. Do you have any idea of what happens inside or? Yeah, inside, we don't know. We just have the S matrices at the boundary. Okay. And in general, um, there are many ways you could go down. So you know very well, just adding some CDD zero, for instance, would lead you down in this uh, region. So you don't have a unique as matrix there, and yeah, we don't, we don't know. When you do the maximization, so for this choice of yes, so I yeah, I was very quick about this. Sorry. Um, to arrive at this monolith, what we do is repeat this maximization procedure for two hundred thousand different NAs. <laughs> okay. So yeah, you can. One way to do it is to choose NAs living in some sphere. You discretize it somehow. And this is how you explore this 3D space. But be that by choosing even more values, you have different bounds. Like, um, no, I mean, you, kind of you can converge just make the more dense your grid and start filling the space in between. But it's really something continuous. Actually, you know, by unitarity, this should be a convex space. So yeah, there's not a freedom to have something, some peak between your points. Uh, thanks for the beautiful talk. So um, is there an intuition for what could be the model uh, having as a, a, a nice matrix, uh, the parabolic Jan Baxter? Periodic. <laughs> the periodic, or yes. what, yeah. Um, no, if you have some idea, it would be very nice. I, I should, um, Stefano, Fidel, and I worked in, in in a project that was motivated, at least for my part, from this. So, yeah, it's a very obvious question. Like, what are all these other theories that we find that we don't know? Okay, it's free theory or nonlinear model. What are the rest? So what we were trying to do is to look into interval theories where we have more tools um, that have many resonances. So as I was saying, this is a periodic solution. You have this infinite product of gammas and zeros. So basically infinite resonances. And you want to know what are the physical properties of S matrices with many resonances. So for interval theories, you can use the thermodynamic method ansatz if that says something to you. So you can look at the ground state energy of the theory. And what we found is that basically once you add two resonances, uh, you end up in, in a situation where you don't have a normal UV fixed point. So it's related to these uh, TTVAR um, uh, deformations. So what we want to say, although I haven't done it for these OM theories, is that these theories with many resonances would have some non-trivial UV behavior, some higher temperature. So in a way, you can say, oh, okay, these are just unphysical, but I think this is really telling us that we should go away from this paradigm and understand these other theories with non-trivial UV properties. I think there is time for one, or at most two questions. A very brief comment on this, because I guess that uh, in general, there is an expectation, I believe, that the S matrix, or maybe like the derivative of the logarithm of the S matrix or something like that, it should sort of go to zero at large rapidity, right? It should have some behavior also at infinity. Yeah. And that's also related to locality and good UV behavior. So I guess on these general grounds, you could expect that anything that has any sort of periodicity would yes. immediately have this sort of Yeah, problems, right, and right? this was our expectation. What we found, however, is that you don't need periodicity. You just need 
two resonances. Okay, okay, so it's even stronger. Yeah. So I will ask the last question. <laughs> <laughs> so if I understood correctly, most of these results, uh, they have been possible because there are no anomalous thresholds, no such singularities in the regime that you have been looking at, yes. right? But what I haven't understood is in your ansatz for analyticity, what would you have changed in order to accommodate for these anomalous thresholds? Because yeah. this row of X, it looks like to be the discontinuity. Yeah, so, so the it could be, I row mean, is still the discontinuity, but you would add these specific higher poles for when you can write this triangle diagram, But they will come up in the row, in the row of X already, I mean... No, 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 no? These, these singularities are inside the the physical sheet, so... Mm. But they cannot come into the row of X. In the S-plane you have something like this, I said we can have bound states here, the anomalous thresholds would be some, for instance, some double poles here or some other pole that it's not coming from a bound state. Um, yeah, so in two dimensions, it's really just higher poles uh, in there. this region. So there is no other possible singularity in the branch cut? Um, that in, could I mean, this is the sheet, the, the physical sheet. So the boundary is really starting at this uh, branch cut at 4m squared. I'm not saying anything about the other sheets. So um, one thing I mentioned is that, of course, you have higher order um, thresholds. So this would be other cuts. But I'm just focusing on the physical sheet. So yeah, uh, I'm not saying anything about the inside the branch cut. I see. So there will just be other singularity inside. Yeah, mm -hmm. here. N nothing else. OK. Very good. So I think we can thank Lucia for the nice talk. Thanks.